China returns samples from the far side of the moon. SpaceX will be deorbiting the International Space Station. Could you surf the methane waves on Titan? And who knows when Starliner is coming home? All this and more in this week's Space Bites. Right on schedule on June 26th, China's Chang'e 6 sample return return to Earth, landing in Inner Mongolia. Capsule landed safely and was picked up. They analyzed it locally and then they moved it to Shanghai for them to do a proper opening. And then they're going to be handing out portions to various research scientists. And this is really important because this is the first time that any spacecraft has ever landed and lifted off from the far side of the moon and it collected samples. So while Chang'e 6 was on the surface of the moon, it had a radon detector, it had a negative ion detector. And of course, it deployed the mini rover so that it could take a selfie of itself, which is such a flex. And because it was at the far side of the moon, it had to relay all of the information and the communications through a satellite that was in orbit around the moon, it was able to drill down two meters underneath the regolith, collect some samples, fly them back up to space, meet with the capsule module and return these samples back to Earth. So at this point, with the samples in hand, Chinese researchers are now going to be analyzing and studying and seeing how the regolith on the far side of the moon differs from the more familiar regolith on the near side of the moon. And of course, all of the bits and pieces of this mission will help put them on track for sending humans before the end of the decade. A Chinese company tests a reusable rocket. China's Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology, or SAST, is continuing to test a reusable rocket. So, you know, obviously it is very inspired by the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. The 3.8 meter rocket blasted off from the Gobi Desert, flew to an altitude of 12 kilometers, and then returned to the surface and landed gently. And this is leading to even more tests. So the next test that they're gonna to launch to a 70 kilometer altitude, and they're also gonna be putting grid fins on the booster so it'll be able to guide its way back to close to the launch site before it does its propulsive landing. And then the goal for 2025 is to launch a 6,500 kilogram payload into orbit. And if that happens, then a Chinese company will be capable of launching payloads into orbit using a reusable first stage booster, which, you know, obviously this is a thing that SpaceX has been doing for a long time, but it just shows that they are catching up. Deorbiting the International Space Station by 2030. Now we've known this has been coming for a long time. NASA has said that they're planning to deorbit the International Space Station around the end of the decade. And the Russians have said that they're no longer going to be maintaining their side of the International Space Station after about 2028. So we really only have a few more years before the International Space Station is going to be deorbited into the ocean. The problem is that it doesn't have enough thrusters on board, doesn't have enough spacecraft attached on board for it to be able to direct and decide where this thing is going to crash into the earth. And so without the ability to actually choose the landing location, it would happen randomly. And it's a very big machine. And so a lot of it would survive orbit has a chance to crash into people's homes. It's danger to people on the surface of the earth. The previous plan was to use three progress cargo vehicles attached to the International Space Station and between the three of them plus the station's own thrusters, that would be enough to deorbit the station. But then because Russia is pulling out by 2028 and they need a way to do this at 2030, they're going to be going with their own solution for this. And so based on that, NASA has contracted a company to deorbit the International Space Station in 2030. Any guesses who they picked? SpaceX. Now, we don't know yet exactly what the deorbiting vehicle is going to be. Is it going to be a souped up Crew Dragon? Is it going to be a Starship? We don't know. But we do know that they are going to be giving SpaceX a little more than $800 million to deorbit the International Space Station by 2030. And that will give enough thrust to be able to direct it into the spaceship graveyard which is in the South Pacific Ocean, where Mir and other large spacecraft have been deorbited in the past. You know, when I think about the potential uses for Starship, like, do you want to use Starship to land human beings on the surface of the moon? You know, maybe later at the end, but like start by docking the International Space Station and then it and the station going to a fiery demise. 
that seems like it makes a lot of sense. That's a good use of Starship as a first, as an early test. I have a lot more faith in them being able to use it to crash the ISS sooner than, I'm trying to think of a way to say that. But yeah, yeah, that seems like a good first test to me. Do we know where all the nearby stars are? Now, when you go outside and you look at the night sky and you see a bunch of stars, you can see thousands of stars with the unaided eye, but they're not normal stars and they're not close stars. They're unusual stars, stars that are large, stars that are very bright. And in many cases, the stars that you're seeing are actually pretty far away. Only a few of the stars that you can see in the night sky are within about 10 parsecs of us, about 33 light years of Earth. And for the longest time, astronomers only knew of a fraction of those stars. And that's because while some of them are like the sun and some of them are fainter stars, most of them are going to be red dwarf stars or brown dwarf stars, which you need a very powerful telescope to be able to detect. In fact, like the closest star to the sun is Proxima Centauri. It's only 4.3 light years away. And yet we didn't know about that star until the 20th century when powerful telescopes were available. But astronomers are trying to build up a comprehensive list of all of the stars, build a three dimensional map of the area around the sun. And thanks to Gaia, they've been able to fill in a lot of the missing pieces of that map. And at this point, they found 462 objects in 339 star systems. And they estimate that they're still missing about 40% of the objects that are in our vicinity. So we've got a long way to just get to the point that we can map out about 30 light years away from us in all directions. Every week we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the coolest space news story of the week. And this week the winner was pretty slim, which was that astronomers have seen a supermassive black hole become active in real time. So thank you everybody who voted. Now we're going to post the poll for this week's space news within about 24 hours that you're watching this, but we'll also put it into the community tab. And if you're just scrolling on your phone, scrolling, scrolling, and you see the vote come up, just go ahead and just tell us what you think. Now, the best chance to see it is to subscribe to the channel, to click on the notifications bell, to watch a bunch of our videos, to feed and train the algorithm that you want to watch more space news. All hail the algorithm. Another strike against primordial black holes as dark matter. Now, I want to go on record that I am a huge fan of the idea that dark matter is explained by primordial black holes. So black holes that formed at the beginning of the universe of varying masses from the mass of a proton to supermassive black hole. And then some of those black holes have evaporated, but the larger black holes are still wandering around in the universe. And if you have enough of them, they can totally account for dark matter. But the problem is that the observations haven't matched that potential. And so a couple of weeks ago, we reported on Universe Today how astronomers have been looking at the kinds of black holes that have been merging with gravitational waves. And that if primordial black holes existed, then you would expect to see a certain number of the black hole mergers be the kinds of black holes that would be outside of the boundaries of the ones that would form by dying stars. And they're just not seeing enough of that. And so they said, okay, no, primordial black holes must account for less than 1% of dark matter. And now another survey called the Optical Gravitational Lensing Experiment, or OGLE, has been watching for gravitational microlensing events. So you get the situation where you've got a star and then something massive passes in front of the star and it lenses the light of that more distant star. And then you can measure the mass of the object that passed in front. And astronomers do this all the time and they've found exoplanets this way. And so the OGLE experiment has been going since 1992, but recently they released two decades of observations from this experiment. And they said that if primordial black holes accounted for all of the dark matter that's out there, they would have detected about 1100 of these lensing events and they only detected 13. And they were able to explain all 13 as stars passing in front of other stars. And so unfortunately, 
there doesn't seem to be evidence for multiple lines that primordial black holes can explain dark matter. But I, I, I still I have hope. And if you want to learn more about primordial black holes and their possibility as an explanation for dark matter, I've done several interviews on this, including one fairly recently. Could you surf on Titan? When NASA's Cassini spacecraft was orbiting around Saturn, it did a lot of passes on Titan, which is Saturn's largest moon. And it made an amazing discovery about Titan, which is that there are lakes of methane around the polar regions of Titan. And, and not just lakes of methane, there are rivers of methane, it rains methane, there's this whole methane hydrological cycle there. But when they looked at the lakes, the surface was so smooth that planetary scientists assumed that there just aren't any waves on Titan. And that makes sense. I mean, Titan is a fairly small place. It's not like you have a global ocean where wind can continue to blow and build up the heights of waves, like the kinds of things that we see here on Earth. But scientists wondered, is there another way to figure out whether or not there are waves on Titan? And they looked at coastline erosion. Here on Earth, when there are high winds in a lake, you can actually see how the waves that build up are eroding the coastlines around it. And so they looked at the coastlines on the Titan lakes to see if they're eroded. And according to their simulations, yes, that to get the kinds of shapes of the lakes that you see on Titan, there would need to be some level of coastal erosion. Now we still don't know how big the waves are, but some of these simulations could guess that the waves are as large as one meter. And above 10, 15 centimeters, you could probably surf on Titan in the low gravity. Uh, so that would be pretty cool. So now I think not only do we need to see a submarine on Titan, but we need to see a surfboard on Titan. Satellites can track garbage in the oceans. Now we're all familiar with plastic junk floating around in the oceans. I mean, you go down to the beach and you can just see all of the plastic bottles, plastic bags, nets, all of this junk. But it's really hard to get a sense of how much of this stuff there is out there and where it's actually moving and what pathways and currents that it's following. And so researchers used 300,000 images from the Copernicus Sentinel-2 satellite, which takes images of the surface of the ocean every three days. And then they were able to use a machine learning algorithm to detect deposits of trash on the surface of the ocean and then track how this trash is moving around in the Mediterranean over time. They estimated that 95 square kilometers in the Mediterranean is covered in garbage. Now, based on this technology, based on these techniques, they're hoping that there will be better satellites that are gonna be launched that will provide the kind of resolution to do this more directly. But their hope is they can improve the resolution by about a factor of 20. And if that works, then we'll get really accurate measurements of all of the garbage in the ocean. We don't know when Starliner is coming home. Now, two weeks ago, I told you that Starliner was gonna be coming back in a week and I'd give you an update. And then we learned that it was delayed. And so last week I told you that I would be giving you an update. And so the update is we don't know when Starliner is coming back. So just a couple of days ago, NASA announced that they're still working through and troubleshooting the issues with Starliner with the thruster problem, as well as the helium leak problem with the spacecraft. And so based on that, they just have provided no return date now until they feel like they've completely troubleshooted the problem and they know that it's safe for the astronauts to come home. Now there's no rush. There's plenty of supplies on board the International Space Station. The astronauts are being put to work, helping with science experiments. And there are no other missions that are going to be flying to the ISS this summer. And so there's no need for docking ports and things like that. So at this point, I'll let you know when something happens with Starliner, but let's just assume that it's going to be there for a while. Now you're watching Space Bites, but while you're doing that, I'm writing my weekly email newsletter. This is of course this gigantic email newsletter that I send out every Friday that contains all of the space news that we're covering on Universe Today, as well as just like all of the other interesting stuff that I found on tons of different websites as well. So if you want a comprehensive look at everything that's going on in space, you should definitely subscribe to the newsletter. For example, here's a couple of stories we're working on. Could we use an asteroid's own dust to deflect the asteroid? Commercial satellites could track spy balloons and UFOs and simulating the last moments before neutron stars merge. So 
That's just an example of some of the stories that we're covering in the newsletter that I don't even have time for here on Space Bites. So if you want to join the 70,000 other people who get this newsletter every week, go to universetoday.com slash newsletter. It's completely free. I write every word. There's no ads. You can unsubscribe anytime you like. As always, I like to wrap up with some cool images or videos. So first, check out this amazing 3D visualization of the Pillars of Creation that was released by NASA. And they made this using both the Hubble Space Telescope, which took those first iconic images of the Pillars of Creation back in 1995, but then they also used newer imagery from James Webb. And these are star forming regions in the Eagle Nebula. You've got these brand new stars that are enshrouded in this cloud of gas and dust, but then the powerful stellar winds are blowing against this and producing these kind of pillar like towers. But now you can actually fly around and see what this looks like in 3D with real data delivered by these spacecraft. And then second, NASA just gave us a new simulation of what the Lunar Gateway is going to look like. So there's this fairly long flyby where it travels around the Lunar Gateway. You can see all the different modules that are going to be attached to the Gateway. And not just the core ones that NASA is going to be providing, but also ones from some of its international partners. You can see the Canada Arm. You can see the Orion capsule docked onto it, as well as potentially lunar landers. So definitely check out that. And then one final quick video, here's a bear on my property who checked out my camera. Now, when you heard the news about the International Space Station, I'm sure you said, why don't they just, and I'll deal with that in a second. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Gross, Bill, David Giltonen, David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Monzo, Paul Robach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Chiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. I know it feels like a tragedy that the international community and NASA are going to be crashing the International Space Station into the ocean. And it is a perfectly functional space station. And there are astronauts who are flying to it. And they're doing tons and tons of science on board the station. And yet, the plan is to deorbit it. And I'm sure in your mind, you're already typing, why don't they just, why don't they just raise its orbit? Well, unfortunately, if you tried to raise its orbit, you would have to spend a ton of money to be able to raise the orbit. And then you're going to have to continue to maintain it. Otherwise, it's going to wear down. It's a machine. And so if you're just going to raise its orbit, then you might as well just continue staffing it and sending astronauts to it. And NASA doesn't have the budget for that. They have a new priority. They're going to the moon. And so they can't keep maintaining the International Space Station. Why don't they just send the space station to the moon? Well, the problem is the space station is designed to work in low Earth orbit. And to move it to the moon would require just a ludicrous amount of energy. It takes so much propellant to carry it up there. And it really, you know, again, is still an old machine. And so it's going to be having maintenance problems wearing down. It was designed to work in low Earth orbit. Why don't they just sell it and give it to some commercial provider? Well, nobody can afford it. The amount that it would cost to be able to take on the responsibility. And when you consider the risks that when this thing actually re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, it's going to crash in a random location on Earth and that NASA would be held responsible for that. And so they launched it and they're going to be responsible for bringing it back down. But it's possible that the commercial modules that are already attached to the International Space Station will be detached, maybe attached to other commercial modules. And so portions of the station might still remain in orbit. So right now, unless somebody comes up with some really clever new idea, the International Space Station is going to be deorbiting in 2030. All right, we'll see you next week.